Uh, hi guys, this is this is David. We're continuing with this three bet four dy bet dynamic between these two players. Uh, we're going to change a couple of things, and the main reason I'm doing this right now is because I wanted to show a case where we actually reached an equilibrium, and that's what we have right now between the original raiser and the three better. We have an e equilibrium. Now previously, we were using a 100 hand range, okay, for the opener. And I explained that that was not really an appropriate range to use in an aggressive game with tough players. It was more something that you would use in a full ring game where there were some loose passive players and you wanted to save part of your range so that you could be in multi-way pots and make money. And it's a smart thing to do, but it's not a smart thing to open limp in aggressive games where there's very little uh, limping, where there's a lot of three betting, and where there's going to be very few players that uh, will call raises with marginal hands. You're not going to be able to come in with king-10 suited, uh, have three limpermen after you, and then after somebody raises, have everybody call, and then say a big multi-way pot with a hand that is a fairly good drawing hand. That's not going to happen in, in an aggressive game. Okay, so all those hands that were previously uh, limpers like pocket nines, pocket tens, some of our pocket jacks, a uh, king jack suited, king ten suited. Those hands were going to come in for a raise instead. And we still have our polarized range here. Okay, we have easy calls, easy folds, easy three bets, things like that. Uh, for the most part. Uh, but this is going to comprise about 12% of the total distribution of hands. See right here, we've already run the simulation, it's 11.8% of the total hands. Now, we still need to protect ourselves from a 3-bet, okay? The 3-better comes in for $60, he puts pressure on us, and we still need to defend between 30 and 31% of our range to keep him from making an auto profit with his bluffs. Now, because we have a lot more hands here, defending with our premium hands alone will not be sufficient, okay? Uh, so here, we included some 4-bet bluffs. We have uh, ace-queen, both suited and offsuit, and we have ace-jack suited. And those are going to be our 4-bet bluff hands. And by combining our value range, with it, which is pocket queens are better and ace-king, along with our 4-bet bluff hands, we have a total uh, number of hands to defend against a 3-bet that equals just over 30%, uh, which is optimal. Our opponent will not be able to exploit us. Now, when our opponent attacks, he's attacking us, he's using his value range, he's using our, his blockers, and what he wants to have is a range that is made up of 60% value and 40% bluffs. When we come back at him, he's going to need to defend about 40% of the time to keep our bluffs from making a lot of money. Okay, And as it turns out, uh, with the little slippage, the rake, blah, 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 it turns out that he's okay with just about 38%. And that's what he's defending with here. He has his value range, queens are better, and then he's sometimes uh, coming back with pocket jacks as well. Okay, now, about our four betting range. Okay, there's a concept we have to go over here, which I introduced a little bit while earlier, which had to do with the fact that when you are only calling a raise and not coming over the top, that you have to defend with a larger portion of hands. Okay. Now, if we calculated this the way we were previously, okay, uh, we say when the when the opponent is sho is five bet uh, shoving, okay, he has a four hundred and forty dollar stack, and the pot is currently two hundred and seventeen dollars, so he's betting four hundred and forty, and we divide that by four forty plus two seventeen. And it shows that that's a, that he needs a to make an automatic profit. Uh, you know, he, he needs about uh, sixty-seven percent folds, which means that we have to defend something like thirty-three percent of the time. Okay, but the fact is that he doesn't need an auto profit because he's going to have equity to improve with some of his hands. Okay, because we're not able to come back over the top. So that means. Whereas normally, if we could come over the top, we would only need to defend with about 33% of our hands. There's a multiplier factor. 
and I'm not sure exactly how it's derived, but we actually have to defend with about 1.8 times as many hands. So if we take this 33 and we multiply it by 1.8, somewhere between 1.8 and 2, we come up with about uh, 59 to 60 percent hands that we will have to continue with out of our 4-bet range. So what we see is that it's the, it, the exact flip when you get to 4-betting. When you're making your 3-betting range, it's going to be 60% bluffs, 40% value. But when you get to your 4-bet range, if you're against an optimal opponent, it's 40% uh, uh, bluffs and 60% value. Okay, So we, we see that when he comes over and he shoves in, that indeed, 61.5% of the time, uh, we're calling. Now, this is optimally balanced, and I'm going to show you what happens if we disturb the balance at all. Right now, practically every hand in both opponents' ranges is profitable at every stage. We look at our opening range, and every hand is profitable. We look at our opponent's three-betting range. His bluffs are just about breaking even. The only hand that's losing a slight amount of money is ace-jack offsuit, which is one of his three-bet bluff hands, and it's only losing 44 cents. It's coming about as close as we can to making his bluffs break even. And what we want is like the weakest hand in his bluff range to break even or come out slightly uh, losing. Okay, when we go to our four bet range, okay, we've included as four bet bluffs ace queen suited, which is making two cents, ace queen offsuit, which is also making two cents, and ace jack suited. Uh, which is making a dollar eighty-five. It's making a little bit more than these better hands because it's not affected by blockers as much. It has <clears throat> that jack in it. Okay. So all of the hands in our bluff range are profitable. Now we get over to his five betting range where he's shoving. He's shoving his value hands: ace, king, uh, aces, kings, queens, ace, king suited, ace, king offsuit. But he's also shoving with. Uh, pocket jacks. And his pocket jacks are a profitable shove here because we have, because it has some fold equity against these uh, four bet bluff hands that we have, and sometimes it's going to beat ace king. It's, in fact, it, it usually will beat ace king. Okay, now, with everything optimally balanced, with the ranges, the calling percentages, and everything like that, what if one player decides to get greedy? and start exploiting the other. Uh, what happens? And this is going to show you why the best thing to do in a vacuum may not be the best thing to do metagame. We're going to assume that these are two players that play against each other frequently. Uh, they both have poker tracker or a holding manager. They can go back through the hand histories and they can see just what's going on. Okay, And they can make adjustments against each other. Right now they've made adjustments and nobody has an incentive to change. But suppose this player uh, who was the original three better, and he's now shoving, he looks and he says, you know, my pocket jacks are a profit profitable shove here, and I'm only shoving 81%. If they're profitable, why don't I just go ahead and shove all the time with them? Now we see right here, his EV for his entire strategy, starting with the three bet, he's making 90 cents for the entire strategy. What happens if he starts shoving all the time? Okay, we're going to increase that frequency to 100%. Now, of course, his, his profit's going to go up. Okay, he's making a penny more. He's making 91 cents total, and profit jacks are profitable. But here's the downside to it. Look at the four bet bluffs from the original opener. Okay, ace queen suited and ace queen offsuit have now become unprofitable. They're losing money. We didn't want to do that. We didn't want to make the, the opponent's four bluffs lose money. We want them him to be indifferent. Okay, when they're losing money, what does he do? He cuts them out of his range. He's looked at Poker Tracker and he decides, you know something? Against this opponent, Ace Queen is no longer a profitable four bet. And this is where the knit war begins. Uh, knit war is a term I heard from uh, Matthew Jonda in looking at some of his optimal play videos. And it this illustrates a little bit the way it works. Okay, this guy started uh, 
you know, going all the time with pocket jacks instead of just 81%. He made these unprofitable, so we stopped bluffing with them. Now what happens? Okay, what happens now that we've stopped bluff, four bet bluffing with ace queen? His shoves become unprofitable. His pocket jacks, his ace king offsuit, and his pocket queens all become profitable, and his total profit for the entire strategy has gone down to 89 cents. Okay, so you say, well, what is he going to do uh, now about it? Well, now the pocket queens, ace king, and pocket jacks are unprofitable. He's going to stop shoving with those. So let's take those out of his range. Okay, so now he's only shoving with aces, kings, and ace, king suited. Let's see what happens. Now, of course, his profit goes back up. It goes up to uh, 99 cents here. But what happens over here? The guy that was previously calling the shoves with uh, pocket aces, pocket kings, pocket queens, ace king, ace queen, uh, those become unprofitable. So what he's going to do is he's going to start calling with only pocket aces. Okay, that's his adjustment. Okay, now see, now see what's happened. His profit has gone back down all the way to nine, to eighty nine cents. So this guy started this guy started the war <clears throat> when neither one had an incentive to change. He started the war by getting a little bit greedy with his jacks. And he increased his profit a little bit. Uh, the un, the original raiser uh, then responded by uh, cutting out his four bet bluffs. Okay, then he had to respond by reducing his shoves. Then he had to re to respond by reducing the frequency that he that he called the shoves, and the whole net after all these adjustments and readjustments is that uh, the guy who decided to get a little bit greedy with his jacks is making less money than he was before. He's only making eighty nine cents. Okay, now let's put these ranges back to what they were. He's calling with pocket queens are better, ace king and ace king suited. Uh, he's shoving with pocket uh, with pocket queens of better and ace king. He's raising with uh, he's shoving with pocket jacks, but he's only doing it eighty one percent of the time. And he is four bet bluffing now because it's going to become profitable again with ace queen. Now we hit the simulate button, and now he's back to making 90 cents. So it, it shows the way this dynamic works. Right now, everything's in equilibrium. Every, nobody has an incentive to change. And if anybody does try to change, his opponent's going to make a counter change. It's going to go back and forth. And you're going to end up playing less optimally. And what you want to do is you want to be neutralizing each other when there's another uh, optimal player at the table. Because what's going to happen is you're going to make money from all the fish that are caught in the crossfire. The blinds, the bad players that have limped in. And that's what happens when two aggressive players that are playing close to optimal start battling each other. Okay? They're more or less breaking even against each other, but they're making money off of all of those that are caught in between. Okay? Uh, that's all for right now.